episode 4 of Lost Flight MH370, we will begin our investigation into the possibility that a malfunction of the electrical system could have led to the loss of Flight MH370. As one might imagine, the electrical system of a large aircraft, such as a Boeing 777, is an extremely complex system. Any in-depth look into such a complicated system would be tedious. We will therefore focus our overview on those items pertinent to our investigation. We can make one observation as we begin. The primary source of AC electrical power aboard an aircraft such as a Boeing 777 is via the jet engines. We know that MH370 flew on some seven hours after the transponder went offline. Therefore, the aircraft had a source of electrical power available till the end of the flight. On that note, let's begin with a general overview of the electrical system and the avionics of the Boeing 777. The Boeing 777 is an extremely complex machine. As such and by necessity, it is computer controlled via an intricate array of sensors and special equipment. This complex array is centralized under the AIMS system, AIMS being an acronym for Airplane Information Management System. The actual AIMS hardware is located in the electrical equipment bay, which lies just under the cabin floor near the cockpit. The AIMS hardware interfaces with approximately 130 LRUs or line replaceable units, switches, sensors, and indicators. Under the AIMS umbrella would be found all of the various systems needed to fly and monitor the status of the Boeing 777. Some of these systems would include navigation, communication, flight data recorders, the aircraft condition monitoring system, and the electrical system. The AIMS information critical to flight operations can be monitored as needed by the pilots of the aircraft on the captain's and first officer's cockpit displays. The electrical system itself is controlled by the ELMS system, ELMS being an acronym for Electrical Load Management System. The ELMS system automatically controls the distribution of electrical power on the aircraft. This system constantly monitors the electrical system for any sign of failure. ELMS will shut down any component within the electrical system that is malfunctioning and send an alert to the pilots via the ICAS system, an acronym for Engine Indicating and Crew Alerting System. The Boeing 777 electrical system is comprised of a series of power sources, which are either AC, alternating current, or DC, direct current, according to need. The main power sources when the Boeing 777 is in flight are the two main engines and their associated IDGs or integrated drive generators in the APU or auxiliary power unit. An IDG is a mechanical unit, one located on each main engine, that consists of a constant speed drive and an electrical generator combined into one unit that derives electrical power from the rotation of the turbine engine. In the case of the Boeing 777 designated MH370, the two main engines were Rolls-Royce Trent 800 series engines, specifically model RB211892B17. The APU generator mounted at the rear of the aircraft is the electrical equivalent of either of the two main engine generators. The APU on flight MH370 was an allied signal GTCP331500 b Any two of these three main generators can power the entire AC load of the Boeing 777. The left main engine powers the left main bus. The right main engine powers the right main bus. The APU ties into and can power either the left or right main bus or both main buses as needed. Let me note here, for the uninitiated, that an electrical bus is simply a channel such as a wire or cable that conducts electrical current in a given system. All of the main electrical buses on the Boeing 777 are wired to the electrical distribution panels in the electronics bay near the cockpit. 
If either of the two main engine IDGs fail, the pilots can power up the APU, allowing it to replace the failed main engine IDG. If the aircraft should experience a sudden loss of both main engine generators, the APU will start up automatically even if the APU cockpit switch is in the off position. If the aircraft should lose two main generators, the ELM system will automatically initiate the backup power system. It should be noted that as the aircraft moves from its primary power sources to its backup power sources, the ELM system begins to shed non-critical flight systems. Among the systems no longer powered would be TCAS, Traffic Collision Avoidance System, SATCOM, Satellite Communication System, the Wright HF Radio System, Position and Exterior Aircraft Lighting except Nose Gear Landing Lights, certain non-essential passenger cabin lighting as well as all non-essential cabin equipment such as galleys and in-flight entertainment systems. The backup power source is supplied by the backup generators, which are also located on the two main engines, one per engine. The backup power system comes online automatically if only one of the three main generators is functioning. If all three main generators go offline, the backup power system will only power essential aircraft equipment. Each backup generator itself contains two PMGs or permanent magnet generators which supply DC power to the DC flight control electrical system. The main DC electrical system uses four TRUs or transformer rectifier units to provide DC power. The TRUs are powered by AC electrical power but transform that AC power to DC power for the computer systems and cockpit display systems that use 28 volt DC power. The standby power system consists of the main battery, the standby inverter, the RAM air turbine generator aka RAT and the C1 and C2 TRUs transformer rectifier units. The standby power system is an electrical power system of last resort. If an aircraft has fallen back to its standby system, it is most likely in dire straits. The main battery is located in the electrical equipment bay. It serves as a DC power source for certain cockpit instruments as needed during an emergency. There is also a second battery located in Rack 10 near the rear of the aircraft which is the dedicated APU battery used for APU startup as needed. Under the standby system, the main battery powers the captain's flight instrument bus providing DC power to only the captain's flight instruments. The main battery also powers the standby inverter, which converts DC power to AC power as needed for certain critical AC powered systems. The RAT or ram turbine generator is a power source of last resort. The RAT is located on the right side undercarriage of the aircraft just aft of the main right wing structure. It will deploy automatically if both the left and right main AC buses lose power in flight. The RAT can also be manually deployed by the pilots from the overhead hydraulics panel in the cockpit. The RAT provides power for the captain's and first officer's flight control instrument bus via the C1TRU and the C2TRU, as well as power to critical flight control hydraulic systems. If the RAT is unable to maintain sufficient RPM to generate electric power, its electrical load is shed accordingly, with the main battery temporarily picking up the load until the RAT can establish sufficient RPM for power generation. The pilots have a degree of control over the various power sources via the overhead electrical control panel in the cockpit. They can engage or disengage various power sources as needed. In this depiction of the overhead electrical power panel, we can see the switches for the various power sources such as the main battery, APU, left and right main generators, and the backup generators. On the overhead hydraulics panel, we can see the manual deployment switch for the RAT or RAM air turbine. This is just a very simplistic overview of the Boeing 777 electrical system, but it gives us a basic idea of the Boeing 777's electrical generating capabilities and limitations. Next, we will take a brief look at a few examples of aircraft incidents in which the electrical systems were at fault. We will then move on to some final observations about the Boeing 777 electrical system and finish with a summation of the electrical malfunction line of pursuit.
Our look at the Boeing 777 electrical system shows that a modern fly-by-wire aircraft such as the 777 has a great deal of redundancy built into its electrical system. Without electrical power, the plane is unable to stay in the air for very long. Let's now take a look at several instances where the failure of the electrical system aboard an aircraft led to an emergency situation. This will give us some basic insight into how the pilots of a stricken aircraft dealt with the challenge of an impaired electrical system. We can then use these examples to extrapolate possible insights into the mystery surrounding flight MH370. The first incident we will examine is flight LA-8084, a routine scheduled flight by Latam Airlines from Sao Paulo, Brazil to London Heathrow Airport. On December 20, 2018, Latam flight LA-8084 departed the Sao Paulo International Airport bound for London Heathrow at 0027 local time or 0227 UTC. The flight designated LA-8084 was a Boeing 777-300 with 341 passengers and 16 crew aboard. At 0050 local time, the flight leveled off at flight level 290 or 29,000 feet. Shortly after leveling off at 29,000 feet, the aircraft suffered a sudden failure of its primary electrical system. Passengers on the flight later reported that there was a strong odor in the cabin followed by a sudden loss of cabin lighting and the in-flight entertainment system. The captain announced that the aircraft had suffered a serious electrical problem and the flight was diverting to the Belo Horizonte Airport which lay some 250 nautical miles northeast of Sao Paulo. Flight LA-8084 was approximately 90 nautical miles southwest of the Belo Horizonte Airport when the pilots began their diversion for an emergency landing. The captain contacted air traffic control at Belo Horizonte requesting clearance for an emergency landing. The power failure was so extensive that the aircraft's RAT or ram air turbine had deployed. The only electrical instrumentation being powered was that connected to the standby buses. This included the captain's and first officer's flight control displays, one VHF radio, and some emergency lighting. In his communications with air traffic control, the captain reported, we're practically without any electrical system working correctly, okay? He further added, so we have this problem, a bit serious, okay? The captain requested several times that firefighters be standing by when the aircraft landed. The pilots realized that the aircraft would be landing overweight with a heavy excess of fuel on board. With electrical power at standby levels, the aircraft was unable to activate those systems that would have allowed it to jettison its excess fuel. Air traffic control, aware of the overweight issue, asked the pilots, please confirm to control if you will proceed to land now or if you will do some holes to burn fuel. The captain replied, no, no, we'll proceed to land, sir. At 0143 local time, flight LA-8084 made an overweight landing on runway 16 at the Belo Horizonte Airport. The plane landed safely, but due to the overweight stress on the landing gear, the brakes overheated, causing the fuse plugs in the tires to open, deflating the landing gear tires. The following investigation into the failure of the electrical system on flight LA-8084 found that the problem was not an issue with the electrical generating system, but with the electrical distribution system. A short in a connector from the right backup generator to the right converter caused a series of breakers to trip that paralyzed the electrical distribution system. All of the main power generators, the IDGs and APU were functional, but with the electrical distribution buses shut down, the main generators were taken offline. Let's take a look at one more incident. We will then compare these two incidents with the known facts surrounding flight MH370. The second incident we will take a look at involves an electrical system failure aboard a Qantas Airlines Boeing 747-438 designated Flight QF2, which occurred on January 7, 2008. The Qantas Boeing 747 was on a scheduled flight from London, England to Bangkok, Thailand. 
the aircraft was carrying 346 passengers, 15 cabin attendants, and four flight crew members. At 0837 UTC, 337 p.m. local time, the aircraft was about 25 kilometers northwest of Bangkok at flight level 210 or 21,000 feet, beginning its descent into the Bangkok airport. At this time, the lead cabin attendant informed the pilots that a substantial water leak had occurred in the forward galley. The attendant also reported that the cabin attendants had attempted to mop up the water with four or five blankets. The attendants were unable to determine the source of the water flow. At about 0839 UTC, the aircraft's ICAST system alerted the flight crew to a bus control unit issue. The message seized after a few minutes. At flight level 150, 15,000 feet, the four flight crew members occupied their assigned seats in the cockpit for landing. As the aircraft passed through flight level 100, 10,000 feet, at about 0846 UTC, the aircraft's flight displays began to indicate numerous fault warnings related to the electrical system. AC buses 1, 2, and 3 were no longer powered. Auto throttle disconnected, autopilot disengaged. The ICAST display began to spool out three to five pages of warning messages. The lead cabin attendant informed the pilots that the passenger cabin lights had gone out. The pilots began to action their non-normal checklist for problem solving, but the immediacy of landing caused them to abandon this approach in favor of concentrating on landing the stricken aircraft. The aircraft had now fallen back to standby power. The only operational flight instruments online were the captain's primary flight and navigation displays, the standby instruments, right flap position indicators, and one radio system. The standard company operating procedure required that the flight crew declare an emergency to air traffic control. The captain elected not to declare an emergency as the aircraft was already vectored in for a landing and was next in line to land. The captain calculated that an emergency declaration to air traffic control might lead to needless confusion and possible delays. The approach to the runway was in daylight with no weather issues to work. The first officer reported to the captain that the ICAST system was displaying no issues with the aircraft that would impact the landing. The captain was flying the aircraft manually. The engines were providing sufficient thrust. The landing gear and flaps were configured. There was no air traffic ahead and no reason they should not be able to bring the aircraft in for a safe landing. At 0907 UTC, the Qantas Boeing 747 landed safely at the Bangkok airport. The subsequent investigation determined that the cause of the electrical failure was due to water leakage from a galley sink that was positioned just above the main electrical equipment bay. Water from the galley had apparently been leaking over an extended period of time down into the electrical equipment bay. On January 7, 2008, accumulated corrosion coupled with the large water leak prior to landing caused three of the aircraft's four generator control units, or GCUs, to automatically shut down due to internal electrical faults, which led to a cascading series of problems. The investigation also noted that the close proximity of the aircraft to the airport was crucial in a safe outcome to the flight. If the Qantas flight had been more than 30 minutes from its destination, the outcome might have been much more dire. The pilots were able to fly the aircraft due to power provided by the aircraft's standby batteries. The standby battery power would only have lasted for about 30 minutes. Without that battery power, the pilots would have had a very difficult time controlling and navigating the aircraft. One of the insights this incident provides is how a mundane thing, such as a water leak from a sink, can put an otherwise healthy aircraft into a life and death struggle. The main takeaway from these two incidents is that once a large complex fly-by-wire aircraft, such as a Boeing 777, loses its primary electrical power sources, it has a limited time to continue to fly. In the case of flight LA-8084, we see that a fault in the electrical distribution system created a sudden crisis for the pilots, but the standby electrical system powered critical flight systems giving the plane time to reach a nearby airport. 
In the case of the Qantas Airlines flight, close proximity to the airport along with standby battery power allowed the plane to land safely. Once the Qantas flight lost its main electrical system, leaving the aircraft functioning solely on standby battery power, the pilots had 30 minutes to get their plane safely on the ground. In the case of MH370, we know that the aircraft flew on some seven hours after its transponder went offline. This loss of the transponder signal being the first tangible clue we have of something going wrong on the flight. If the loss of the transponder signal is attributed to some malfunction of the electrical system, the aircraft would have needed to take immediate measures to land. It did not. For MH370 to continue flying for seven hours, a robust electrical system would be needed. To further substantiate this point of view, we have a crucial clue provided by MH370 itself, that is, the SDU coming back online, and particularly insightful is the SDU's final logon at the end of the flight. The transponder and SDU events provide us crucial insight into the state of the aircraft's electrical system during its flight. Let's spend a few minutes examining what these two clues reveal, then finish up our look at the electrical malfunction line of pursuit. As we finish up episode four, we want to take a look at two pieces of equipment that can provide us with some tangible insight into what was happening aboard MH370 on the night of March 8, 2014. These two pieces of equipment, our two clues, are the Boeing 777's transponder and satellite data unit. We will start with the transponder. Let's begin by taking a look at what a transponder is and what it does. The transponder is a key piece of equipment in commercial and private aviation that allows air traffic control centers around the world to track and identify aircraft within their airspace. An aircraft's transponder works in tandem with the ATC secondary radar to help track and identify an aircraft. A typical air traffic control center's radar system is comprised of two types of radar, primary radar and secondary radar. As we look at our radar assembly model here, the primary radar dish is the lower larger dish. The secondary radar is the upper straight planed array. As the tandem radar assembly rotates, the primary radar emits a pulse of electromagnetic energy radio waves that illuminate the surrounding airspace. Any aircraft within the range of the primary radar will reflect back a small amount of this emitted electromagnetic energy which is then received by the primary radar dish. This reflection is processed via the ATC's computer system and shows up on the radar screen as a blip. Primary radar can show the range and bearing of an aircraft, but that is all it can reveal. Primary radar cannot identify the aircraft, therefore it is of minor help in the overall task of safely controlling a given airspace. This is where secondary radar comes in and is crucial in allowing air traffic control to track and identify the aircraft within its airspace. The secondary radar works in conjunction with an aircraft's transponder. The term transponder is an amalgam of the words transmit and respond. The secondary radar transmits an interrogating electromagnetic pulse as it rotates along with the primary radar dish. An aircraft's transponder responds to this interrogating pulse by transmitting back a given set of coded information that includes such data as flight identification, altitude, and airspeed. This information is tagged to the primary radar return on the air traffic control radar screen, allowing the air traffic control operator to specifically identify any transponder-equipped aircraft flying within the range of its radar system. The transponder units on a Boeing 777 are located in the electrical equipment bay of the aircraft. MH370 was configured with two Bendix King TRA-67A Mode S transponders. In this graphic of the Boeing 777 electrical equipment bay, we can see the two transponder units located on the E1 and E2 equipment racks. 
The two transponder units are designated ATCL and ATCR, left and right units, the dual units allowing for redundancy. The transponder settings are controlled via the transponder control panel, which is located on the first officer's side of the Boeing 777's aisle stand in the cockpit, as we can see here. When MH370 was preparing for departure from the Kuala Lumpur Airport on the night of March 8, 2014, it was assigned a squawk code by the Kuala Lumpur Clearance Delivery Air Traffic Controller. Assigning a squawk code is a typical pre-flight requirement for commercial aircraft performed at airports around the world daily. A squawk code is a four-digit number derived from the number set 0 to 7. This assigned squawk code is entered into the transponder control panel by the pilots. This four-digit code will then be transmitted in the data set broadcast by the aircraft's transponder, assisting in the identification of the aircraft on air traffic control radar screens. In this recording of the conversation between Kuala Lumpur Air Traffic Control and the pilots of MH370 prior to takeoff on March 8, 2014, we can hear the air traffic delivery controller assigning MH370 its squawk code prior to pushback from its gate. Boeing 7370 is set to Beijing via PBOS Alpha Departure, 6,000 feet squawk 2157. Beijing PBOS Alpha 6,000 squawk 2157, Malaysia 370, thank you. As we can hear, MH370 is assigned the squawk code 2157. Most likely, First Officer Farik Abdul Hamid dialed in the squawk code as the aircraft was preparing to push back from the gate. Once MH370 was airborne, Kuala Lumpur Air Traffic Control observed and tracked the flight on its radar displays using data from MH370's transponder via secondary radar. Right at 39 minutes into the flight, MH370's transponder stopped responding to the interrogation transmissions from the secondary radar systems of the regional air traffic control centers. MH370 effectively disappeared from their ATC radar screens, most importantly those of Kuala Lumpur and Ho Chi Minh. The cessation of the transponder signal occurred near GPS waypoint Agari as MH370 was in the process of transferring from the Kuala Lumpur Flight Information Region to the Ho Chi Minh Flight Information Region. Though MH370 was no longer visible to secondary radar, it was still visible to primary radar and was thus observable to the Malaysian military radar system. But why did MH370's transponder go offline? Before we answer this question, let's take a look at the curious circumstances surrounding MH370 satellite data unit, or SDU. Let's begin by taking a few minutes to look at what a satellite data unit, or SDU, is and what it does. The Boeing 777-designated MH370 was equipped with a Honeywell MCS-6000 SATCOM system. The SATCOM system is an aircraft communication system that operates via a satellite network. In the case of MH370, this network was the Inmarsat satellite communication system. MH370 was also equipped with VHF, very high frequency, and HF, high frequency radio systems for communication purposes. VHF radios are short range systems, distance restricted by line of sight transmission limitations. HF radio systems bounce radio signals off the Earth's ionosphere for long distance communication, but atmospheric variability can degrade the radio signal. Thus, the SATCOM system is superior for long-range communications and offers greater operational flexibility. The Honeywell MCS-6000 suite is a six-channel system with five voice channels and one data channel. This SATCOM suite is composed of three units, the SDU, satellite data unit, the RFU, radio frequency unit, and the HPA, high power amplifier. The SDU is at the heart of the system. The satellite data unit is the interface between the linked aircraft avionics systems and the SATCOM radio components. 
The RFU converts the signal from the SDU to an L-band signal for the high power amplifier, L-band being the radio spectrum frequency range from 1 to 2 GHz. The HPA then boosts that signal to the power level required for transmission to the satellite via the aircraft's radio components and SATCOM antenna array. As we can see in this depiction, the MCS-6000 suite is located in the E-11 rack above the galley between the Boeing 777-200ERs, Zones 2 and 3. This puts the MCS-6000 suite in close proximity to the aircraft's array of satellite antennas. In this synoptic view of the SATCOM system, we can see some of the aircraft avionics systems that communicate with the SDU. Among these systems would be the AIM system, with all its myriad components, including ACARS and the passenger telephone system. In the case of MH370, the aircraft's SATCOM signals were received by the Inmarsat 3F1 satellite stationed over the Indian Ocean. The satellite then relayed the radio signals on to the ground earth station, GES, located at Perth, Australia. The ground station at Perth, via its connections to the general communications infrastructure, passed the received signal on to the designated end user. The end user could then communicate back to the aircraft via the same system. Let's now take the information we have gathered earlier in this video and see what we can extrapolate from the evidence presented by the SDU and transponder. As we look at the flight timeline of MH370, there are certain key points where the SDU and transponder provide us with some important insights. At 37 minutes into the flight, Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah signs off contact with Kuala Lumpur Air Traffic Control with Less than two minutes later, MH370 secondary radar signal disappears from the Regional Air Traffic Control Center radar screens, most importantly Ho Chi Minh and Kuala Lumpur. MH370's transponder has gone offline. There is no distress call from MH370. The aircraft flies on but now on a course significantly altered from its filed flight plan. At 1 hour and 22 minutes into the flight, a ground-to-air ACARS data request by the Inmarsat satellite network goes unanswered by MH370's SDU. We know at 25 minutes into the flight timeline, the SDU responded to a data request transmission from the Inmarsat network. This means that sometime after the 25 minute mark, up to the 1 hour and 22 minute mark in the timeline, the SDU went offline. At 1 hour and 43 minutes into the flight timeline, MH370's SDU comes back online and sends a logon request to the Inmarsat satellite network, the first ping. This first ping occurs just as the aircraft has cleared Malaysian military radar coverage. MH370 then continues to fly on some 5 hours and 54 minutes on a course that takes it deep into the southern Indian Ocean. Along the way, the SDU continues to respond to the Inmarsat satellite network, answering five more pings in nominal fashion, with the last scheduled ping response, ping number six, at seven hours and 29 minutes into the flight. Then, about eight minutes after ping number six, MH370's SDU sends a logon request to the Inmarsat satellite network. This is referred to as the seventh ping. This tells us that about five to seven minutes after the sixth ping, the SDU went offline. The scenario envisioned by experts at this point is that MH370 had reached the limits of its fuel supply. Based on historical statistics of MH370's Rolls-Royce engines, the right engine would have exhausted its fuel supply first. It shut down and the right main electrical bus was now unpowered. The left engine exhausted its fuel supply shortly thereafter. The left main electrical bus was then unpowered. MH370's SDU SATCOM system was powered via the left main bus, thus lost its power source and went offline. The power sources for the standby electrical system, the main battery and the ram air turbine will only power the standby buses. 
They are incapable of powering the main electrical buses. There is now only one power source left capable of powering the two main buses. That is the APU or auxiliary power unit. As we learned earlier in our look at the Boeing 777 electrical system, when both main buses are unpowered in flight, the APU will start up automatically, even if the APU switch is in the off position on the overhead electrical panel in the cockpit. Though the aircraft was at the point of fuel exhaustion, there was sufficient fuel in the lines leading back to the APU to allow it to run for a short period of time. The APU takes about one minute to spool up and start providing power to the two main buses. At 7 hours and 37 minutes into the flight, MH370's SDU, now powered up, reboots and sends its logon request to the Inmarsat satellite network. The network affirms the logon request. At 081937 Malaysia time, MH370's SDU replies to the Inmarsat satellite network with a logon acknowledgement. This is the last transmission from MH370. If we look at the entirety of the flight timeline, we see no indication that MH370's electrical system was impaired or at fault. Up to the 39 minute mark in the flight timeline, all systems aboard the aircraft seemed to be functioning properly. There was no indication from the pilots of any problems. The fact that MH370's SDU was powered and functioning during the last 5 hours and 54 minutes of the flight seems to indicate the electrical system was functioning normally. The ELM system does not consider SATCOM a high priority system when the aircraft's electrical system becomes impaired. This tells us that the automated systems responsible for oversight of the aircraft's health were signaling no indication of electrical system impairment during the last hours of the flight. Across the entire flight timeline, we see no sign of fault with MH370's electrical system. Therefore, no indication that it was responsible for the loss of flight MH370. The mysterious circumstances surrounding the loss of the transponder signal and the temporary loss of the SDU signal do not appear to be directly connected to technical failures. The most logical alternative appears to be some form of human intervention. The transponder goes offline just as MH370 is transferring from the Kuala Lumpur Flight Information Region to the Ho Chi Minh Flight Information Region. The SDU goes offline across a span of time that could place its shutdown in the same time frame as the loss of the transponder signal. The basic purpose of the transponder and SDU is to communicate to the outside world the location and status of the aircraft. Is it possible that some person aboard MH370 was erasing the aircraft from the view of the world for an unknown purpose? Given that, then why does the SDU come back online about three minutes after the aircraft has passed out of Malaysian military radar coverage? Just as the SDU passes information about the aircraft to the world, it also passes information about the world to the aircraft. Was this a consideration by someone on the aircraft? Or is it possible that the aircraft experienced another issue that incapacitated the crew leading to the loss of flight MH370? In episode 5 of my series Lost Flight MH370, we are going to look into the possibility that a loss of cabin pressure led to a cascading series of problems that doomed the flight and all aboard.